Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Andrew Beattie, and I'm the president of iPolitics Live, and it's a real pleasure to welcome everybody here this morning. Um, I'm going to welcome our viewing audience as well. It, you know, as we're starting off the month of May and National Vision Month, unfortunately, I don't think that Mother Nature got the, 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 the memo on this one that May is supposed to be full of flowers while April was full of showers. So here we are, May 1st, and it's raining. Um, but unfortunately, I would want to thank everybody who made the effort to come out this morning. Um, before we get started, I want to thank our, uh, our, our lead sponsor this morning, the Canadian Association of Optometrists. And I'd like to welcome Dr. Barry Thenis up to the stage to say a few words and, open, and frame this morning's discussion. Dr. Thenis. Thank you, Andrew, and good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all in the room and those that are joining through iPolitics Facebook platform to this morning's iPolitics Live event, hosted by ourselves, the Canadian Association of Optometrists. It is fitting that we are holding this event today as it allows us to kick off National Vision Health Month. And this is a very busy time for eye health and vision care providers and those that are providing rehabilitation services, as well as vision research funding bodies. So, my name, as Andrew said, is uh, Dr. Barry Thenis, and I've been practicing optometry for 42 years in a small town in uh, southwest Saskatchewan. And I can honestly say that I really love what I do. Throughout my career, I've approached the delivery of eye care and vision care from a patient-centered perspective. I work collaboratively with uh, other health care providers in the best interests of my patients. I was passionate enough about my profession to become involved in the Provincial Association and through that ultimately into our National Association. I am here today in my capacity as the President of the Council for the Canadian Association of Optometrists and I want to take just a few minutes to tell you a bit about us and why we are here with you today. So the Canadian Association of Optometrists or CAO, everything in health has an acronym as you know, was founded in 1941 and it was found, I'm proud to say it came from my uh, home province of Saskatchewan, which we would say is the birthplace for many things in healthcare in Canada. Formerly, we were incorporated in 1948, and the first objective was to consider and act upon all matters uh, which have dominion-wide effect upon autometry. For more than two decades, CAO has been trying to meet this objective through public awareness campaigns to encourage optimal eye health and vision care for all Canadians. 60% of Canadians report having a vision issue. For those of us that are a little more than 50, that will reach about 100% of us. So doing what we can to provide information and awareness to help them with that is a duty and an obligation for us in optometry. 
Vision issues touch all Canadians, so we are committed to ensuring that Canadians receive the best standard of eye health and vision care that is possible. However, we are increasingly concerned about what we can only describe as an emerging crisis in eye health and vision care. 5.5 million Canadians have vision-threatening eye conditions, which is expected to increase by about 29% over the next decade. And we are, of course, not alone in our concerns. It was for this reason that CAO has joined forces with the Canadian Council of the Blind, the Foundation Fighting Blindness, and CNIB, whose Executive Director in National International Affairs uh, is Diane Bergeron, who is with us today. And Diane, of course, brings not only the view of CNIB to the vision debate, but her own unique personal perspective on vision loss. Together, these groups have developed the federal role in eye health and vision care. This is a paper that encourages the federal government to exercise its leadership in this issue. The federal government's activity from development of a comprehensive national drug strategy to a pledge to improve health services for Canada's Indigenous peoples suggests a reaffirmation of its involvement in health care. That provides a wonderful starting point for honouring previous commitments to eye health, including the World Health Organization's Resolution on Universal Eye Health. It is also an opportunity to honour current commitments that recognize the changing needs of the health care system and the federal government role as an essential partner in improving outcomes and quality of care for all Canadians. So I would like to make very clear that we aren't asking the federal government to own the whole issue. As a sectoral stakeholders, we are very willing partners in this undertaking. And if the call of improving eye health and vision care isn't enough of it to entice the federal government's interests, the cost of doing so should be. By 2032, vision loss is expected to cost more than $30 billion annually. In fact, vision loss has the highest direct health care costs of any disease category in Canada. So we are joined today on the panel by Nick Nanus. I'm assured that everyone in Ottawa knows Nick. That's what he told me. So perhaps he needs no introduction. Uh, CAO has commissioned Nick's firm, Nanus Research, to poll Canadians on their level of support for, Canadian invol for federal involvement in eye health and vision care. So he will be sharing these results today and having a sneak peek at, at what I am heartened to, to hear by the results. Laurie Clement, the CEO of CAO, there's a nice mouthful, <laughs> has been in the trenches on all of this for the past year. Laurie will share a bit with you about just how our call for the collective immediate leadership can help respond to Canadians' very real fears about vision loss. So before I complete my remarks, I'd also like to extend an invitation to each of you to join CAO, CNIB, the Canadian Council of the Blind, and the Foundation Fighting Blindness for a mini expo hosted by Senator Percy Down on Parliament Hill tomorrow between 4 and 8. If you're interested, please come and speak to me when this event is over or to Laurie or any of the uh, CAO people that are here. So once again, I'd like to thank you for joining us today and hope that you not only hear our clarion call, but you are willing to join us. Thank you. So now, without further ado, let's get into the discussion on this, because I think it is worthy of that. And our, we have nobody better to lead that discussion uh, than Catherine Clark, our veteran journalist. So Catherine, the show's yours. Thank you, Andrew. Et bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. C'est un vrai plaisir de vous accueillir parmi nous ce matin. Nous sommes ravis que vous avez choisi d'être ici. Thank you for those of you who chose to float in and, uh, and join us today. Um, I think, as Andrew was saying, that the weather has um, forgotten that we've transitioned now to May, but we're going to give it a little bit of time. And it is a great reason to be here, though, because um, May is, in fact, Vision Health Month, as we've heard. So this is a great way to start it off. And we're going to be examining, as, um, as Dr. Athenas was pointing out, 
the um, a fed, where a federal vision for eye care, uh, vision care strategy fits within a national health care policy. And um, clearly the doctor was making the point that this is very much an attempt to build a collaborative partnership, that um, this is uh, an opportunity to take a pressing problem, which is only going to increase, and, uh, and to find some real substantive solutions for it. I am uh, delighted to have with me uh, a series of really excellent panel guests who are going to take us through the issue and, and suggest some potential ways to, to address it and to move forward. Nick Nanos um, has, uh, has already been introduced, and of course I won't, um, uh, I won't um, tease you anymore, um, but Nick is the president of Nanos Research. Lori Clement, as we, um, as we know, and, and thank you, Dr. Thinas, for <clears throat> introducing all of them. I'll just do it briefly so that we can put faces to names for those who may not know it. Lori Clement here is the CEO of the Canadian Association of Optometrists, and Diane Bergeron is the executive director of national and international affairs with the CNIB. <clears throat> Probably the most popular member of the stage is not any of the human sitting on it, <laughs> but the beautiful uh, dog whose name I will not say in case I wake uh, wake her, <laughs> and she shoots to attention. Um, but we're delighted to have all of you with us today. And I'm going to go through a couple of quick housekeeping notes, ladies and gentlemen, just for those of you who may not have been a part of an iPolitics Live event in the past. We use a digital mechanism for asking questions, which is called slido.com. And I see that a number of you are already on your phones or tablets. Please don't put them away. You're going to need them if, in fact, you would like to ask questions at the end of the discussion. So if you go on to the website www.slido, which is slido.com, you will be able to input our hashtag for this session, which is iPaulVision. You'll see it uh, on the screens here as well. And um, this will allow you to become part of this particular day's forum and allow you to ask questions, which will then appear on our screen, and we will, I will be able to ask them of our invited guests as well. It allows us to move through questions just a bit more quickly, which is why we really like this system. You can also like other people's questions. You can favorite questions as well. This helps to move those questions higher up so that they're more likely to be asked by me during the Q&A session. We're going to try a little sample poll. And um, let's see what our poll is. According to the National Coalition for Vision Health, by 2032, 2032 vision care is expected to cost Canadians. Is it 30 billion, 20 billion, or 10 billion? Oh my, look, the rain has not dampened your brains at all. What a clever bunch. Okay, so you're absolutely right. It is 30 billion. And that is how Slido works. Pretty simple, pretty efficient. And um, that, uh, if you have any questions, you can let me know when we get closer by writing them out on Slido. But otherwise, um, we will get to the Slido portion after the panelists have had a chance to speak. But you can begin submitting your questions at any point during this discussion. Now it's time to turn things over to our very patient panel, and uh, we'll begin with Nick Nanos. Um, as most of you know, and all joking aside, Nick is one of the country's most respected pollsters, and um, <clears throat> he's also one of the country's most respected and accomplished research experts. And he's going to walk us through a recent survey and give us a, a lay of the land that will help to, uh, to contextualize our conversation today. So over to you, Nick. Sure. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so uh, I'm going to give you an advanced look at a survey that uh, will be released by the Canadian Association of Optometrists uh, later this week. You know, it's interesting, whenever we do research and polling and ask Canadians about healthcare in general, uh, it's always very important. Uh, but what we wanted to do in this particular instance was to look at how eye care and eye health care fits into the ecosystem of healthcare writ large. And then to explore, quite simply, how people feel about the role of the federal government, about the role of the provincial government, about the role of having them both work together, and, uh, and to understand what people want, how, I guess it would be how they think it should be, and, uh, and to look at potential roles for all the different partners. And, uh, you know, it's interesting, I found uh, the study was actually quite And 
uh, Canadians and ask them how much of a health priority eye care, dental care, hearing care was to get a sense of comparability. How does eye care stack up against these other comparable possible priorities that touch the day-to-day -day lives of Canadians? And you know, the interesting thing, and uh, I also have to say that no one knew who was the sponsor of the study was, so it was a completely blind and independent test. But uh, what was quite interesting, all three were important, not the big surprise. But what was quite striking in the results is that what scored as the top priority for average Canadians was eye care. At about, they, they on average gave eye care a priority of 8.3 on a 10 point scale, followed by dental care at 8.0 and hearing care at 7.7. .7. So the key takeaway, all these things are important. But in terms of top of mind priorities, things that Canadians are focused on, things that touch their day-to-day -day lives, eye care actually ranks higher than both uh, dental care and hearing care. And you know, the other thing that we wanted to test on is who has a role and who potentially doesn't have a role in, uh, in promoting eye care, better eye care across Canada. And uh, what's, what I found, uh, the number that popped for me in this whole study was that Canadians want and expect a collaborative partnership between the federal government and the provinces. Asked about whether they wanted to see the, the federal government work independently, the province work on its own, or both work together, about 23% of Canadians thought, you know what, provinces should go it alone in terms of uh, eye care. 3% thought the Fed should go alone. Seven out of every 10 Canadians, or 68%, thought that the federal government and the provinces should be working together to advance better eye care across the country. And, uh, and the other interesting thing and had to do with what should be done, right? Obviously, there are a number of different things that could be potential priorities, things that the federal government and the provincial government, that all the different stakeholders can work together on. And we tested on funding new eye care research, a national eye health strategy, and also funding a public education campaign. So all three of those, and we asked people, we asked Canadians whether the federal government should have a major role, a minor role, or no role at all. And uh, of the three, at the very top of the list, about six out of every 10 Canadians thought that the federal government should have a major role in funding eye health research. And uh, another 26% thought that it should have a minor role, a lowly 6%, or to put that into context, one out of every 20 thought that the federal government should have no role in funding this. And that was at the very top of the priority list. And the second one had to do with promoting a national eye health strategy. 52% um, thought that Canadians should have a major role and another 26 a minor role. And, uh, and that this was one of the other kind of top priorities. The public education campaign, the feds, you know, still a majority thought the the Fed should have a major or minor role, but the intensity was not as strong, right? And you know, as a researcher, I have to tell you the good news, and then the really good news, which is what I just told you, and then the good news. So the good news is that, you know, they still want to see, Canadians still want to see the federal government have a role in funding a public education campaign on uh, health care, but that when you think of what comes to mind in terms of urgent priorities they want to see the federal government engage on, it has to do with two things funding research, and the national eye care strategy. When they hear those two things, that's what they expect and that's what they would like to see the federal government engaged on. So, to close, what are the three things that we learned from the research? First of all, eye care is on the radar. Not only is it on the radar, it is a top priority for Canadians compared to other different health priorities. Second, there's an expectation that the federal government and the provinces work together on this. People know that the provinces play a leading role in healthcare, but they see that the federal government has an important role, especially when it comes to eye care. And then the third key finding is we have to think of what Canadians at least, and you have to remember, Canadians are not experts, right? This is just what they'd like to see. They'd like to see the federal government take a major role in advancing research, in advancing a national eye care strategy, and also to play a role in funding a public education campaign. So, you know, I think to close, the key takeaway is 
This is very important. People are very engaged. They want to see everybody work together, right, for better eye health care across Canada. And, uh, and I think this represents a significant opportunity for the federal government, but also for the CAO in terms of engaging the federal government in a positive way to advance what Canadians want. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, Nick. That's great. It's good to hear what some of the priorities are before we launch into the discussion as well, because it really does help to contextualize uh, what we're going to talk about today. And I'd like to point out, ladies and gentlemen, that as, as Andrew had said, we do have a very large um, online audience for this event this morning through our, our Facebook Live partnership. And so um, this is clearly a topic that not only are we discussing this morning and that has widespread interest, but that we're going to be hearing a lot more about um, in the days to come, I think. And so I, I'm fairly sure that um, Laurie, Laurie Clement from the Canadian Association of Optometrists has some very strong thoughts about this. And I'd like to turn the floor over to you now, Laurie. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us to talk about taking some substantive action around eye health and vision care in Canada. So thank you, first of all, for, for joining us. Um, while we commissioned Nick to take the pulse of Canadians on federal government involvement in eye health and vision care, we also wanted to get a sense of the priority of eye health and vision care for Canadians. And as Nick has said, at 8.3%, it's a significant priority for Canadians, something that didn't surprise us because we know that Canadians' number one fear is uh, fear of loss of vision. So the fear of that disability is, is significant and yet it's often overlooked. What we constantly find is that people aren't thinking about their eye health and vision care. And so that's part of why the group got together to talk about and, and create a call for action. It's always striking to hear about the fear of vision loss because we know that vision loss can be prevented or treated 75% of the cases. So this is something that's really uh, something to celebrate but we don't do enough celebrating because although 75% is a good news story, the reality is that, as Barry said, billions of dollars are spent annually due to the lack of attention to eye health as a component of our overall health. And that number isn't going down anytime soon, and it certainly isn't going to go down unless we um, give some at a spe specific sorry, attention to the issue. I was doing some number crunching just before we came, and admittedly, it was on the back of a serviette, so it's not high-level math. Um, that works in Ottawa, though. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> so that's good. Um, but uh, Canadian optometrists over the past 20 years have invested over $50 million in trying to raise awareness of eye health and vision research, uh, vision care in Canada. So the commitment of doctors of optometry to Canadians' eye health, I think, is demonstrable. Um, however, despite our efforts, there are still 5.5 million Canadians with vision-threatening eye conditions. Given this figure and the lack of a coordinated public health effort on eye health and vision care, it seems that we're rather passively uh, awaiting the all-threatened silver tsunami, and one that brings with it some devastating eye disease. More Canadians have age-related macular degeneration, the leading cause of vision loss among Canadians, than have breast cancer, prostate cancer, Alzheimer's disease, and Parkinson's combined. Health policymakers need to turn their attention to vision loss. A 2012 analysis by Deloitte & Touche for CNIB showed the total cost of vision loss to the economy as $19 billion annually. That splits into $8 billion in direct cost and $11 billion in, sorry, $8 billion in indirect costs and $11 billion in direct costs. The cost of vision loss has a profound effect on the Canadian economy due to the costs of lost productivity reflected in higher absenteeism, lower employment rates, decreased salary, premature retirement, depression, and death. The federal role in eye health and vision care paper we're talking about today is a reflection of our collective concerns and the reason we embarked on this call for action. I've outlined the concerns that led to CAO's collaboration with CNIB, Canadian Council for the Blind, and the Foundation Fighting Blindness. What is it that we specifically want what we want, in short, is a comprehensive eye health and vision care strategy that's supported by Canadians in order to maximize the health, independence, and economic participation of all citizens. It sounds simple. Perhaps it's not simple, but it certainly is achievable. We know that it won't take that great a com uh, collaborative effort in order to move the dial on eye health. So our paper, the paper that we're talking about, makes five recommendations that would require the federal government to exercise leadership in certain areas. Recommendations that we know 
um, Canadian support. The first two, um, Nick has uh, alluded to as being supported by Canadians, creating a pan-Canadian framework for action, coordinated and executed by a new Office for Vision Health at the Public Health Agency of Canada. The framework would build on work that was completed by the National Coalition for Vision Health in, in 2007 and be based on public pop and population health strategies. The second is advancing funding for uh, vision health research. We know there's insufficient funding for vision health research throughout the system. And the coalition of the group that we've put together represents a diversity of Canadian communities. And so we're natural partners to improve patient engagement and shape research policy. An important first step in rebalancing current inequities would be to ensure eye health and rehabilitation services representation on dedicated CIHR review and evaluation committees. The other recommendations we put forward had to do with access for Indigenous peoples, uh, developing and, and rolling out collaborative um, care eye pilot programs, and finally, a public education campaign. I think the public education campaign, although it was third uh, uh, priority for Canadians, is important because we don't, as Canadians, we don't think of eye health as part of our overall health. And I think that's something that we really need to change and we can change. More has been done, uh, more, sorry, some has been done, but more has to be done in order to have that register um, with Canadians. So as Barry suggested, we're not suggesting that the federal government would need to do this alone. We've come together as a group in order to put forward or have a call for action. And what we'd like to see is as many uh, people as possible. Other stakeholders will join us along the way, no, no doubt. Uh, the final comment I wanted to make is that uh, when Canada signed the World Health Organization's Vision 2020 um, commitment, it agreed to eliminate the main causes of preventable and treatable blindness as a public health issue by the year 2020. And so to paraphrase our Prime Minister, it's 2017. What are we waiting for? Great. Thank you very much, Laurie. I'm glad that you're, uh, you're here to be able to, uh, to give us your own insight into this as well and your organization's insight. And uh, also very pleased that we have uh, Diane Bergeron with us as well, representing the CNIB. Uh, Diane, let's turn things over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to start by answering the question that you are all thinking at this moment. Um, her name is Lucy. She's a six-year-old <laughs> golden retriever. <laughs> CNIB has just entered into our 100th year. Can you believe it? We will be 100 years old in March of next year. We took the time over the last couple of years to think about where we've been and where we need to go in the future. And during that process, we realized that as an organization, we provided all of these years rehabilitation services to people with sight loss across this country. We provide the ability for people to understand how they communicate with others through, through Braille and through technology. We teach people how to use white canes and how to navigate safely in their environments. And we teach them daily independent living skills how to use their stove and, and be safe in their homes. And we've been doing all of that over all these years as a charity. And we realized that in fact, what we do is part of rehabilitation as a part of the healthcare system and part of vision care. So we worked with the CAO and other partners to look at how do we fit into the healthcare continuum. And this last year, we've launched Vision Loss Rehabilitation Canada. It's a part of CNIB that looks specifically at rehabilitation and puts us directly into the healthcare system. It's a huge move for us, and we're very excited about the progress. I wanted to talk a little bit about the importance of rehabilitation. None of us want to lose our sight. It was not a decision that I made. It was something I was born with. I have retinitis pigmentosa. There will not be a spelling test, so don't get excited. RP is really an eye condition that is genetic. It's a deterioration of the retina. And we found out when I was five. And at five years old, we realized I couldn't see the board at school. I couldn't see the print on the page very well. And we quickly realized by the time I was 10, I became legally blind and I needed support. <clears throat> In rehabilitation, one of the things that I think is, is extremely important is understanding not where you are today, is understanding where you're going to be tomorrow. It is important to learn today what you need tomorrow. 
Because if we wait until somebody is totally blind to teach them Braille, to teach them computer skills, to teach them orientation and mobility and how to take care of themselves safely in their own homes, it is a huge impact on them. It takes a long time to learn. It's important to notice that the dog didn't fall out of the sky with a harness on and I grabbed it and walked away thinking, oh, this is a grand way of getting around. It took years and years of training and experience to be able to become independent in my life. So we need to begin that process as early as possible. We don't wait until somebody needs Braille to teach them Braille. In my life, I learned Braille before I lost my sight totally because I learned this very quickly. I wanted to be independent and so I knew that I would be able to do things if I had the training and the skills. Today, as, a, as Executive Director of National and International Affairs, I travel all over the world, independently, sometimes with a guide, sometimes with my dog, very often with my dog. I do not hesitate to get on a plane and travel to a city I have never been to before, just me and my dog to go to meetings or participate in events, because I have the skill sets. People have asked me in my time, have you been blind all your life? And my answer is not yet. My life is not over. Sight loss does not mean that your life is done. It doesn't mean that you no longer can go out and participate. I am very active at work. I have uh, gone to school and obtained a master's level degree. And I'm an athlete. And in fact, I'm training right now, we were talking earlier, I'm training right now for the Mont Tremblant Ironman this summer. Hopefully I'll cross the finish line. <laughs> but it's something that I can do because I've learned all of those skills and I've received the rehabilitation that I needed to get to where I'm going. So I think it's very important to realize that rehabilitation is a part of the healthcare continuum. We're a part of the system. And we need to continue to provide it proactively instead of reactively. My biggest barrier in this world is not my sight loss. My biggest barrier is the attitudes of the people that I come across on a daily basis. The majority of people in Canada, we just did a survey at CNIB for our employability campaign last year. And we asked the question of people who were employers, if you had two equal candidates, equally qualified for a position. One person was sighted and the other person was blind. Which person would you choose? And a shocking 70% said they would choose the sighted person. There's a reason why our unemployment rate partially sighted is so high. We are at 68% unemployment rate, huge. We need to change attitudes. We need people to understand that we're independent we have skills, and we're capable of doing anything we want to do. And we will contribute to your business and to your communities just like anybody else. So please support the, the uh, call to action that we're doing, because that paper highlights not just the fact that we want to save people's sight, very important. But for those of us that don't have that opportunity, it's equally important that we receive the rehabilitation services that we need to become independent. Thank you. Thanks very much, Diane. <clears throat> Diane really brings a very interesting and, and a unique perspective to this discussion, so we're particularly glad that you're here, Diane. But I think uh, building on some of the things that you've said, um, in terms of rehabilitation, the other element, um, of course, is, is prevention, but also building up an understanding. I mean, as for those of us in this room who are parents, uh, we take our children to the dentist. We take them to the doctor to make sure they have regular checkups. And uh, I know in our family, we take our children um, every year to the optometrist because that is a part of acclimatizing our children to the understanding that this is a regular part of their health care. And so I think that that, that is another um, important element of this discussion as well. Is And that comes to this public discussion about how you create a sense uh, within the broader community that this is, in fact, an integral part, as, as Nick's numbers show, of this broader discussion. So we're going to go to questions now, and um, I see we, we have a, a number coming in, and I'll ask you to, to please keep bringing them in for us, and we'll get to as many as we can. Why hasn't the government adopted vision care as a health priority? And Laurie, I'm going to turn that to you first. Well, that's, that's a good question. I think that, 
you know, I've been in this position for four years, and, and I know that back in 2007 there was a national coalition for vision health, and some uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada did some important work um, in looking at the landscape and doing a lit search and, and what's available, trying to assess the current um, situation. There, for whatever reason, there seems to have been um, a period of inactivity, and so that's the, the reason today is for the four of us uh, organizations to get together, call for action, to determine what would the federal government's role be? Because sometimes we hear conversations that it's a provincial responsibility. So why would the federal government be involved? And hence their need for the, the role, the paper, which defines the federal role in five specific areas. Anyone else want to jump in on that before we head to question two? Yeah, go ahead, Nick. Well, you know, in my experience, <laughs> a lot of times what happens is, uh, you know, especially on the healthcare file, there are so many priorities. That's true. Out there. And, uh, the good and the bad is that you're competing with other healthcare priorities. Absolutely. So you kind of engage stakeholders and they go, we know eye care is important, but we have to deal with and let's just insert something. And I think, um, you know, that's why kind of the ask related to a strategy, which is basically the beginning of a dialogue, not just with the government, but with Canadians. You know, what I thought was quite interesting is that, you know, one of the key takeaways when we asked about the priorities, and this is one interpretation, I would say probably one of the more important interpretations of the survey is that we are not only a priority, but we should be near the front of the line in terms of who you're talking to, right? And to start that dialogue. So, uh, you know, I think a lot of it just has to do with the pressure of being in government and kind of reminding them, you know, here's what Canadians think is important. Let's start a dialogue on this. Which is why it's always important to have the numbers. Yes, or some numbers, yeah. even if they're on the even back they're of a napkin. <laughs> <laughs> Diane, I'm going to direct this next question to you. Isn't the private sector providing enough service and support for Canadians in this area already? Um, absolutely not. Um, when it comes to health care, health care in Canada, the last time I checked, was one of the things that we value in our system is having public health care. Sight is part of health. Rehabilitation for that is part of health. The, <clears throat> excuse me, the provision of eye care is all a part of your health. And I think we forget too often that sight loss also runs into a lot of other things. It runs into people having more falls. We enter into um, home care situations and seniors care on average three years prior to our sighted peers. We have, we, we face more uh, rates of depression than others. And I think it's important to think about this. We cannot just rely on the private sector to provide services for people with, with sight loss. Are there, Diane, can I follow up on that by mm -hmm. asking uh, with regards to the private sector? Are there specific things, I know we're talking mainly about government today, but are there specific things that the private sector could be doing to, to help promote this issue? Oh, absolutely. I think it's important when we think about the private sector that, that they provide awareness, knowledge, and think about how they view sight loss. Do you view it as something that, you sh that we should be paying for as a private sector concern, or do we view this as part of the public health care system? Looking at our own attitudes as part of that sector and helping to educate the public that this needs to go into government. I'm going to um, skip down to the third question because um, I'm going to try to keep us on topic for this specific uh, conversation. Uh, <clears throat> what would be required for the feds to work with the provinces to have a strategy in place? Laurie, I think that's a, a good one for you to grab. I think that the, the first point that's in the, in the paper, it would be the most important. So we need a national vision strategy. And so that national vision strategy will focus on making eye health a, an important component of overall health. And so the health, the health as we know is managed provincially. But the federal role is to talk about the public health imperative of making eye health a, an important part of um, overall health. So we know that the federal government funds um, health care in the provinces, so we need to have conversations about what the, what the terms and conditions of those monies are. Part of, uh, part of that conversation can and should be around eye health. 
Nick, did you? Yeah, you know, another dimension of this, and uh, it, I don't think it, it's not just related to eye health, but everything else. But one of the reasons why on many healthcare issues, people want the federal government to be a partner and an active participant is because they want to make sure that it doesn't make any difference what province you live in, but that you have access to the right kind of healthcare and you have that healthcare environment. And I think that's where they see, you know, they respect and know the important role and leading role that the provinces have to, have to take. But when they think of the feds, this is where the healthcare, the national strategy is important because they don't want people living in one province to be disadvantaged compared to another. And that's kind of the natural segue, I think, to engage the federal government. You know, not that you're, the federal government is expected to carry uh, everyone, but that it has a role in ensuring that there is kind of equal access and equal support across provinces to make sure that the provinces up their game to make sure that uh, it doesn't matter where you live, that the, the right eye health care framework and support system exists right across the country and is equivalent, at least, in as many provinces as possible. And Sorry, but, but yeah. we know that the federal government has a role in promoting uh, health. Yeah. We know mm -hmm. that there's anti-tobacco campaigns. Mm -hmm. We know that there's sure. a variety of, of information that the federal government takes an active role in uh, promoting, um, uh, promoting health and preventing illness. Um, Diane, before we move on from this question, I mean, your role is national and international affairs, so I'd welcome your thoughts on this, too. Yeah, and I would, I would echo the comments that have already been made. I think it's very important that the federal government make this a priority so that the provincial governments understand how important it is uh, in our general health. And because right now, I think that it is being pushed back in the background, and, and it's seen as something that's just uh, off to the side. And it's, it's a key issue, and it's, it's uh, I think, the federal government's responsibility to make sure that that is equal across the, the country and that the education is there. So the next question um, is the one that we'd skipped over, and in, in, in the interest of keeping us um, on track, I'm going to change it a little bit and just ask. So here's the question. Does the federal government have a role in improving Indigenous health? I'd like to focus on the eye health element of that and whether there are particular challenges that are faced by our First Nations communities um, that would also need to be addressed in any, any strategy uh, moving forward. And Lori, um, I think you're in the best uh, spot to answer that. Well, certainly the federal government has a role in Indigenous uh, health care, as we know. Uh, it's a major provider for um, First Nations on reserve uh, and Inuit people. So we know that as a major provider, the federal government uh, plays, plays a significant role. Um, in terms of Indigenous health, there are particular issues, of course. Uh, rural and remote communities access tends to be an issue. There's no nationwide program, for example, for uh, the incidence of diabetes in the Aboriginal and the Indigenous populations is significant. So diabetic retinopathy is an issue. Uh, we need a comprehensive program in order to identify, treat, and manage uh, diabetes within the Indigenous communities. Uh, children's eye health tends to be um, something where we need to add focus. So the children's eye exam before entering school is critical. We know that 80% of learning is visual. So eye exams for children in those communities, in all communities, um, is of particular um, concern. Okay, thanks, Lori. Um, Diane, should vision care be treated nationally, like physicians and hospitals, and have the principles and criteria of the Canada Health Act cover it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Far too often, um, I think that we, we look at vision health as this separate entity and we, we push it. And I think that it needs to be very focused. It needs to be equal um, across the country. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that we can tell by eye health in the rest of our health. And um, so, yeah, I, I would say absolutely this needs to go into the hospitals more. It needs to be more a part of the overall health view. And Nick, your numbers show that Canadians are supportive of the idea of this being a greater part of the, uh, the general health care debate. And yeah, for sure. You know, and I think you know, the other interesting thing, and this is where you know, the importance of the uh, public education campaign, you know, what Diane was talking about, to educate Canadians about the connection that eye health is not a silo, right? Uh, that it is connected to your broader health and uh, is a better way to understand 
potential markers for other health issues that you may have. It would probably be something that Canadians, and I'd always kind of tell uh, people that I'm working with, you know, you have to tell them something new, something interesting, something that they haven't thought of. And I think for, you know, for experts in the area, they, you know this. Optometrists know this, right? But uh, for average Canadians, you know, making that connection between eye health and broader health is probably a great way as having a bit of an aha moment to, to get them engaged and to understand because the reality is they know that it's a priority. Uh, they want it to be a priority for the federal government. They'd like to see action. But you have to also give them, I'd always kind of say, kind of the water cooler talk, right, on why. Not just because it's good for you and that it's right, but there are practical implications for your broader health to do a better job at eye health. Let's go to the next question. Would a national health care strategy include the need for vision checks for young children? Do any provincial health plans cover vision checks for children? Lori? Uh, yes, so a national health care strategy would definitely include a plan for young children. Um, the Canadian Association of Optometrists has frequency guidelines. So what is currently recommended is an eye exam as a young child, an eye exam before school, annual eye exams until you're 19. Uh, and over 65, and then every two years in between the 19 to 64 um, category. Um, the, do any provincial health uh, plans cover it? Yes. Uh, many um, provincial government uh, plans cover eye exams for children, so those under 19 and those over 65, with the exceptions of New Brunswick and Newfoundland, which provide uh, no coverage whatsoever. Um, in terms of the strategy, um, what we would be looking uh, to encourage is at least one eye exam before children enter school. So we know that there are many, um, that, that uh, learning uh, is impacted by, um, by vision, and that sometimes there are issues that are misdiagnosed in, in, um, in school, because we don't think about vision as we do think about the other um, attributes when, when uh, children are having trouble in the classroom. So an eye exam before school would be one of the things that we would be really advocating for. It's going to be an interesting discussion, isn't it, Laura? I mean, this this whole idea of having provinces that are, I mean, clearly this is Canada and, and healthcare. Um, we are well accustomed to provinces having different approaches. Um, but when you're starting on this idea of building a strategy and trying to build one where you can get everyone to come on board, uh, it's an interesting process, I yes. bet. And it's collaborative. I yeah. Mean, that's, the idea is that it's the federal government, the provincial governments, us as NGOs and industry. Ultimately, we would like to see industry involved um, in communicating these messages. Sure. Um, Diane, have other countries done more to prevent vision loss? You know, I, there is, there are um, a lot of, there's a lot of research being done in the UK, in the States, Australia. We have various partners um, around the world I actually don't have the numbers on those, so maybe Lori might know better. But I do know that there, we do work collaboratively with other countries um, to make sure that we're a part of the research. So I'm, I'm expecting that we're all about the same, but maybe Lori knows better. Well, we know that when the World Health Organization, um, we had the, the, uh, the commitment to um, preventing um, avoidable blindness uh, and uh, vision impairment in 2003. Australia took up the challenge probably the fastest. So in, in Australia, there's a, a good national framework for eye health vision care established in 2005. So they've been on it for a while. Um, the United States and the UK both have Vision 2020 organizations, which are umbrella organizations, which bring together the stakeholders trying to advance um, eye health. So um, Canada is certainly behind. Nick, when you were um, gathering this data, were you getting a general sense that Canadians are uh, more aware about vision health than, um, I mean, they were responding to your questions, but they, are they also actually aware of the impact of this on their health? Um, well, in some of the previous research that we've done, it's a bit of a mixed bag. I think the key takeaway, you know, whenever people say something is a priority, it usually means two things. It means that it's important, but they also me believe that stuff needs to be done, that there's an opportunity to do a better job. And, uh, and, I, and I think it would be fair to say that they see it as, as, uh, as an opportunity. And you know, the thing is, the stuff that we we're talking about today, 
it's a pretty low bar. Yeah. Right. Like that's a, you know, it's a very low bar to say, you know, can kids test their eyes before they start school? It's a bit sad. In Canada. <laughs> you know, no, but I'm just saying, it's a bit sad. Um, and, you know, and I think that's an easy ask for a parent, right? Like, you know, you, you take your son or daughter to get their shots. You take, you know, you do all these other tests. You want to prepare them. You know, part of the preparation for school needs to be, you know, not just going to, uh, you know, pick up their knapsack and their pencils. Like, actually, that's probably the least important thing. I don't thing. actually think they use pencils anymore. Oh, sorry. I'm <laughs> getting tablet. So, I'm tablet. so old. Okay. <laughs> getting their tablet. But, uh, but part of the preparation for school has to be an eye test. And that's probably the most important preparation for school, you know, really when you think about it on a, on a practical basis. So, uh, so it just speaks to the opportunity, I think, that's there. In addition to the obvious stakeholders, other health and vision associations, what other stakeholders would you engage, engage with to promote vision health, Lori? Uh, I think teachers are a natural, um, a natural ally. So I think uh, the Canadian Teachers Federation, I think early childhood education uh, workers. Certainly we work with Diabetes Canada and so significant uh, issues with, with diabetes. Um, the, the family physicians, there's a, a significant uh, collaboration uh, for family physicians understanding eye health, understanding the, uh, the exam before school. Um, seniors. Other, Diane, other, Diane. other Sen people? Seniors associations, mm -hmm. I think, are very important and key for us to, uh, given that the majority of the um, individuals facing sight loss is, through age-related macular degeneration, I think that the seniors groups is going to be key in retirement groups. Yeah, Diane makes a good point that the four major causes of, of uh, vision loss are age-related. So seniors are not natural. mine, just to be clear. Mine is not age-related. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what research, Diane, is needed to help Canadians with vision loss? You know, I, I think that there's, um, there's the two kind of key focus pieces. Um, there's the research on how to uh, prevent or treat or cure the sight loss and the, and the conditions that cause sight loss. But I think there's another piece of research that is as important, which is the research around how do we create opportunities within the community to ensure that the environment is built in a way that people with sight loss can best access, that our employment rates um, can increase, that our education system is prepared for people coming in with sight loss, whether it be um, primary or secondary or post-secondary education. There's, there's uh, research that needs to be done around um, advocacy areas. You know, uh, I think that it is appalling that in the, uh, you know, the, in the year that we're in 2017 that we are still facing discrimination in accessing public facilities because we are accompanied by a guide dog. So I think that there's research in all of those areas as well as the research when it comes to um, vision care itself. If, if yeah, I go might, ahead, Lori, please. I think that we could point out that one of the partners that we're working with on this call to action is the Foundation Fighting Blindness. And as a charity, they have for years and years raised money, charity money, um, to research um, um, issues around eye health and uh, vision loss. So I think that's important to recognize that, that uh, NGOs are actually contributing and now it's time to bring a bigger group together in order to advance this uh, call to action. This, uh, in the interest of keeping uh, everyone on with their regular business day, will be the last question for this morning. Uh, prescription glasses and care are already so expensive. $600 for, a, $600 for a pair of glasses won't Fed involvement push costs even higher, Lori? Well, I don't, I don't think that the federal government would push costs even higher. And I think that that's one of the opportunities that we have um, in, in talking about vision care is to talk about value. And so what is the value um, to you for a pe for medical device that you have, whether it's a contact lens or whether it's glasses, what is the value of your site to you? So I think that the conversation is often turned around the cost versus the value. And if you're if you're in a position where your glasses and your contact lenses enhances what you're doing every day, I think that's the conversation we need to be having as opposed to the other conversation. Really, appreciate. Yeah. Did you want to? Yeah, and I'm. Ju I just wanted to also add that there's there's the cost to what is it. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> what is the value to you? But there's also the cost and value to, um, on the other side of it, if you don't have that, there's a loss of productivity in employment. There's a loss of productivity within the community unless you have the supports that you need, whether it be uh, glasses, contacts, surgery, or you know medications, or if it's it's a cane or a dog. There is there is a loss to productivity unless you have the tools you need to do what you need to do moving forward. So I think that there's there's that cost as well. And I think um, the important thing for this discussion moving forward is that, um, as Nick has pointed out, the numbers are there. There is a widespread Canadian interest in having this, um, this conversation move forward. So thank you to all three of you very much for your presence here today. I appreciate your thoughts and your opinions. And I will uh, turn it over now to Andrew Beatty to close out the event. Thank you very much, everyone, and uh, to our panel in this, uh, this very interesting discussion. I know there were a number of questions we didn't get around to answering, and as I say at all our events, and, uh, and you're starting to see this come through to fruition now, your questions were not for naught. Okay, we take them, uh, the ones we didn't get answered, we will take them back to our newsroom. Uh, we will examine them because we know that there's often a good story couched in a good question. So we're gonna take a look at this very carefully. Um, clearly, this, this issue is not going away. I mean, it's, uh, it, it, it's pardon the pun, right before our eyes um, and uh, this morning, and it's competing with many other national health priority issues. And I'm sure that we're going to look forward to examining this uh, further as we, as, we, uh, as we see the, time, the days and the weeks ahead. Um, looking ahead, talking about looking ahead, um, for iPolitics Live events, uh, we are going to be examining sustainable uh, environmental sustainable practices on May 17th, right here at the Rideau Club. Um, we're also picking up on some themes that we've, uh, we've looked at in the past, and with some current events, I will uh, make you a prize of, uh, of a new event that we are going to be launching on um, June 20th, as we're going to take a half-day forum and examine uh, trade issues from an international perspective, where Canada stands on international trade, especially in light of the recent circumstances um, south of the border and with what's happening in Europe. So sorry, both our CETA and NAFTA will be examined in, in, in much greater context. We hope you look forward to, uh, we look forward to seeing you and discuss and welcome you back to those future events. For all future events, take a look at the iPolitics Live, um, iPolitics website and uh, look at under upcoming events and you will see a listing of all our upcoming events. We look forward to welcoming you again and I hope everybody has a wonderful day. Thank you everyone.